so here we have a female of the trobe, is Helena, which is part of the breeding program here. Oh wow, it's absolutely incredible. What's up everyone? In this video I'm going to be talking about breeding bird wings. Well, golden bird wings that is. Uh, because I've witnessed their entire life cycle in captivity when uh, I was working at the Bantai Sri Butterfly Center in Cambodia for uh, over a month. So um, I'm not going to be, pretend to be some kind of expert because I'm not. Uh, those of you who follow my YouTube channel they will know that I'm mainly a breeder of moths, not butterflies. Uh, most of my attention and studies are done on moths and my knowledge of butterflies is only just surface level. So, um, <clears throat> the things that I'm going to be uh, mentioning here are just mainly observations, uh, things that I have directly seen in the wild. Um, one example of, uh, of my limited knowledge is the fact I labeled it as the wrong species first. In fact, in some clips you'll hear me calling them uh, Troides Helena. A female of the Troides Helena. But afterwards I found out they are actually the Troides Iascus, which is a different species. But, um, well, it was really fun to see them in captivity and see them breed, and see what conditions they need to re reproduce the entire life cycle. Most frequently I get questions about the food plant. Now, first of all, the food plant is clearly some kind of pipe vine, uh, an Aristologia. And the food plant for these butterflies is uh, Aristologia, which grows here. It's a type of climbing vine, and as you can see, here's already a female resting on the Aristologia. And I believe the species used is the Aristologia tagala. Now, um, take this with a grain of salt because I'm not that great with plants, okay? But that's what I believe it was, the Aristologia tegala. Um, second of all, what, I, what really stood out about the species was their behavior. Um, I've seen them flying in the wild, actually, and what you'll notice is these butterflies, they can fly really, really high above the forest canopy, um, usually at a high, uh, higher elevations. You'll see them uh, flying very high in the sky above the, above the hills and the mountains even. Um, and in captivity they sort of reproduce that behavior because the adults are um, either very high in the top of the greenhouse or the flight house. Or they are very low, they are like almost at the floor, at the bottom. And this makes sense if you think about it, because um, it's really a canopy species. That means it's a species that flies at the height of the treetops in uh, the forest in Cambodia, Laos and many parts of Asia. And if you look at um, you know, the ecology of these sort of places, of uh, forest habitat, you'll see that there are not many places where these butterflies can go to get uh, nectar. In fact, the two most significant places in a forest environment are either the complete forest floor 
or the forest canopy. There is no middle ground because nectaring plants, flowering plant, plant, plants, the, um, the flowers are usually found on the forest floor or in the treetops from the trees themselves or the plants that grow in the treetops or directly the, sh the low growing shrubs at the forest floor. And this explains why in the greenhouse you will see the moths, uh, sorry, the moths. You will see the butterflies, the bird wings in this case, you will see them sitting, resting very low to the ground. Or you will see them very high, uh, nectaring, flying on top of the greenhouse. Uh, it definitely seems to me that um, in order to have their most natural behaviors, they need a high greenhouse. And I think this flight house it was about five, five to six meters high. And most of the time you could see them flying at the, at the top. And later in the day they would come down, like at floor level, usually for nectaring. Another thing I really noticed is um, when it comes to pairing. Now, pairing these butterflies may be one of the most difficult things to do in captivity. Actually, it's easy if you are in their native range, but if you are a breeder in Europe or America, then yes, then you may have problems. And this is because, uh, well, I saw them pair several times. I uh, even made a video about it. And uh, to me, it seems they pair really high in the greenhouse. So I think they really need the height. They, they want to feel like, um, like they know that they are at, at like forest or treetop canopy level. Now in the wild this may be very high, like 17 meters, but I think in captivity it seems 5 to 6 meters it, uh, it actually worked. And uh, I've actually seen them pair a few times, I even made a video about it. And like I said they were pairing high, so I, at one point I even had to climb a ladder to get up there and film the pairing. So here we see a natural pairing of the Troides Ayuscus in captivity. So the trick to pairing them it appears to be to have a lot of space. Seem to be somewhat of a canopy species that's flying high. So you will probably have the biggest success in a large and big greenhouse like this which is quite high, all things considered. Here we see a ladder. Maybe using this ladder I can get and make a better shot. Okay everyone, so here up close we have a pairing of the Troides. As you can see they pair up quite high. Since people have to hold me with a ladder, hello Ben. And I'm all the way up here so I can film this. Let's see. Oh wow. <laughs> is this worth breaking my back over? Yeah, it was. Thanks for watching. This was Bart with the pairing Troides. Now, when the female is fertilized, um, she doesn't seem very reluctant to lay eggs. In fact, uh, I saw them laying eggs many times on the, on the pipe vines, on the Aristologias. Um, the caterpillars, yeah, they eat a lot of food plant. They go through it very quick. Uh, the caterpillars can be reared uh, on cuttings of food plant, although it's probably better to leave them directly on the fresh food plant. Um, they really eat a ton of it, so you're gonna need a ton of the food plant itself if you want to breed this one. Uh, the caterpillars are very big and beautiful with like these tubercules and. Uh, if they're bothered, they release a weird, weird scent with their osmaterium. It's an organ on their head that uh, releases defensive chemical, chemicals. 
And usually these are the, some compounds with uh, nasty smells that will scare away predators. And most papilio or swallowtails, it's uh, things like butyric acid. But I think in this case it's different. Um, it smelled a little bit bitter, so I think they could be the alkaloids they sequester from the food plants. Or the aristologic acids, because I know that's the that's the toxic main toxic compound in the pipe vines. But uh. so here we see the caterpillar of Troilus Helena in captivity, along with a bottle of its own sort of shriveled up host plant. There you go. Is this is one close to pupating. You think? Yeah. And after this they stop reproducing in the dry season or you keep them all year round because you said they're seasonal? Well we keep them all year round but the numbers decrease. Oh. Largely. It's, it's, it's mainly because you keep them going in captivity, right? Yeah. In the natural cycle. It's okay if I handle it? Yeah. I'll be careful. Now the vine dies back a lot in the dry season. Is this the only caterpillar you have of them right now? Hey, it's, it's trying to eat my finger. Seriously. Okay guys, I'm being eaten by a Troides caterpillar. That's a new one. Beautiful. <laughs> it's okay. No. It's not cute? Cute? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in my opinion, I think the key factor is A, the have to, to have the height, to have the high, high greenhouse. That's probably one of the most important prerequisites uh, to breeding them. Second of all, uh, of course, obviously you need nectaring flowers in their food plant, but this is the same for any butterfly or moth you want to breed so that's not really a special requirement but it is a requirement so the main thing is just space and height they need a lot of space they want to be high uh, well food plant like I said uh, I saw them nectaring a lot of times they seem to spend a lot of time just visiting flowers and at some part of the day the jay will just completely stop and have a rest uh, usually close to the ground or on the or on top of on the or the underside of a leaf of a plant close to the ground, and uh, when they're resting, they are quite calm. You can even handle them gently without scaring them away. They just have a, this little siesta. At a few, uh, I think the hottest part of the day, they take like a siesta. They stop flying for a little bit to conserve energy, and. Uh, well, the males are very active as well. They pursue the females. Uh, they are, of course, much smaller than the, than the female. Okay, so here we have the small male of the Toyetus Ayascus in our breeding program. It's probably gonna fly away when I touch it, but they're gonna get an impression of its behavior and size if I try. Oh, yep. Well, now you've seen the male, right? You like to chase chase a little bit around the, the flight house. Last but not least, uh, one factor I think we are often forgetting is light. Now the ambient lighting is very important if you want to have, make a butterfly habitat because as you know uh, the entire lives of butterflies is dominated by the sun. Because butterflies they like us, they don't have um, a digital clock to tell them what time of the day it is. But despite that Butterflies are quite good at knowing the time of the day because uh, some butterflies they are only active in the morning, some butterflies are only active in the evening, some butterflies are only uh, uh, yeah, active in the, like the afternoon or uh, you know, at specific times or hours of the day even. Uh, they also have different habitats at different times of the day. For example, you may have a butterfly that, uh, that's active for the entire day, but it will only pair uh, for example, around uh, or in the afternoon, it will only pair in the afternoon, 
or uh, they have certain habits or it will it will nectar in the morning on the forest floor and go up to the treetops in the evening uh, i know some some um, african swallowtails do it like the papilio antimachus in the morning they flower in the nectar on the forest floor and in the evening they or in the afternoon they just go to the treetops all day and uh, basically only in the mornings they come get f breakfast on the floor and the rest of the time they're just up there in the trees so how do these butterflies know these specific times of the day well that's because of the sun because that was the point uh, i guess i was uh, diverging a little bit from uh, the thing i was trying to say but uh yeah it's the sun sunlight sun intensity it tells them what time of the day it is uh, it probably tells them how high they are too like i said these things but these this species they like to fly high and i think of course they have good working eyes uh, so they have the visuals but i think sunlight is also what tells them if they are in a good environment now this is not a problem if you breed them in their native habitat okay i mean we are breeding these in Cambodia and uh, it's a species native to Cambodia so sunlight is already there and it's perfect for them because it's what they need it's their natural natural amount of light but in captivity if you are in Europe or America trying to breed these butterflies it may be more difficult because I think they need certain light intensity and maybe a certain angle of sunlight to, to feel okay and pair. And uh, well, uh, I don't know how to reproduce that in captivity. But the sun in Cambodia is really strong. I mean, it's, it was about 38 degrees Celsius there every day. Really this intense uh, sunlight. So I don't know the wavelength spectrum of uh, the sun in Asia if that's any different from Europe but I know there are problems in Europe uh, when it comes to canopy species because uh, sometimes they only fly in one direction or they go to the top of the greenhouse and stay there until they die and refuse to to come down and that's mainly a lighting problem because these butterflies are confused in an artificial environment everything is different uh, we maybe we use light bulbs the Netherlands is not very it's not a very sunny country, so you have many gray and rainy and cloudy days. For these butterflies, it's really unnatural. I think they need really, really strong and intense sunlight coming from all sides and uh, maybe from top too, so they know how to orient themselves. And this may be one of the main challenges of breeding any type of birdwing, but it's certainly true for the, for the Troides golden birdwing. But, uh, yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say. Uh, I don't have many much more to say like advice or uh, because I like I said I'm not an expert so I want to share just pure observations not advice but I hope you enjoyed anyway see you next time hi everyone and thanks for watching my name is Bart Coppens a traveling entomologist from the Netherlands working with moths used to be my hobby but thanks to my exposure on YouTube and social media, it became my job. Thank you for following my travels in Laos and Cambodia, which is part of the video series that you're watching now. This is the outro video, so skip ahead to the next episode if you like. I would just like to remind all of you to like and subscribe, and consider joining my crowdfunding platform. Because as an independent entomologist, crowdfunding enables me to do independent work on insects and improve my YouTube channel. So if you are willing and able, please consider joining. And otherwise I would like to say thanks for watching. And stay tuned for more insects and moths. Bye.